I will always keep my videos here free. The only thing that I ask from you is to like and subscribe to my page. And also check me out on Patreon. Thank you so much. In this video, we'll be talking about nephrotic syndrome. First, as an overview, when we're talking about nephrotic syndrome, we have to keep in mind that there's damage to the filtration barrier that's likely causing all of the other effects. In general, there may be peripheral edema, protein at a level of 3,500 milligrams in a day or more, and low albumin. Because of that reason, you may develop pitting edema because of a change in oncotic pressure. Other kinds of proteins that are lost are gamma globulins. These are important in protecting the body from infections or for immunity. So you have an increased risk of infection and nephrotic syndrome. Other proteins you may lose are antithrombin-3, which may explain why people with nephrotic syndrome may have hypercoagulable states. There also seems to be hyperlipidemia, which may be a compensatory response in nephrotic syndrome. In this slide, you'll see the incidence and different causes of nephrotic syndrome. Most commonly, it is caused by something called membranous nephropathy, or FSGS, which is also called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. In the African-American population, FSGS is the most common. In the Caucasian population, membranous nephropathy is the most common. It can also be minimal change disease, IgA nephropathy, and then 10% are thought to be due to secondary causes. What do we mean by secondary causes? We're talking about a variety of different pathologies that may cause a loss of protein and nephrotic syndrome. Things like diabetes, lupus, amyloid, medications, drugs, cancers, and infections and autoimmune conditions. So just to take a step back when we talk about nephrotic syndrome, essentially we're talking about a barrier problem. So this is a normal filtration barrier. Here we have an endothelium, we have the basement membrane, and we have these podocytes, which is the epithelium. And then you have this urine. And this is a, just another way to look at what we're talking about here. This is the lumen. This is where your blood is flowing, and then it's going to cross the basement membrane across to the other side, past the podocytes. So this is just another way to look at it. So your blood flow is through here, and then it's going to go out and filter through, and it'll end up going through the urine. So that's just normal anatomy. Now, when we're talking about nephrotic syndrome, there's a couple good ways to break down what causes them. So one is to think about it in non-immune complex mediated pathologies. For example, minimal change disease. This is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. It is a very common question to be asked, and it is good to know that it is most common in children. Usually they have normal findings on H&E stain. This is an example of a normal H&E stain. This is the barrier. This is Bauman's capsule, and this is the space. So basically blood flows in here, and it filters into the space over here through this barrier. So in minimal change disease, this is going to be normal. There is an association with Hodgkin lymphoma. And what you see, and we'll look at some pictures, is the effacement of podocytes on electron microscopy. So this was the normal one. And then if you look at minimal change disease, you'll see a flattening of the podocytes. You have to look at it under electron microscope to really see it. And here is an example of that. So again, this is the capillary side. Here's the basement membrane. This is an actual image. And you can see a flattening of these podocytes. Usually they should be more like, kind of like this. So usually it would look like this. However, minimal change disease, it flattens out a little bit like this. You have a selective loss of albumin. It's not due to immune complex, but it's due to general inflammation. If it's not due to an immune complex deposition, then when you're thinking about immunofluoroscopy, it's going to be negative. Also, you're going to have a good response to steroids. That's kind of the reason that you're breaking up this into non-immune complex and immune complex. Because it'll tell you if you do a fluorescence and it doesn't light up, then you know this is not an immune complex problem. You can rule out certain other diseases. So it's helpful in diagnosis. This is very responsive to steroids, over 90% remission in steroids. And usually, classically, the way it presents is a sudden onset nephrotic syndrome. Usually, they don't need a biopsy unless there's no response to steroids. Next, we'll talk about focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, the most common nephrotic syndrome in black and Hispanic population. There, it's called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and the name should help you with what this is. So it's focal, that means it's only some of the glomeruli. It's segmental, which means only part of the glomerulus. So when you look at this, there's several different 
glomeruli here, but you can see the pink stained portions that are kind of patchy, they're focal, and also for each glomerulus, it's not the entire glomerulus that's affected, so it's segmental. So they call it focal and segmental. It may be associated with HIV, heroin, sickle cell. 50% of the time, you can progress to end-stage kidney disease within 10 years, and people don't really respond to steroids. So that's a big deal if you, I mean, end-stage kidney disease is a major diagnosis, and it portrays a very poor outcome. Otherwise, some treatments for focal segmental sclerosis, you may use an ARB or an ACE for kidney protection, cholesterol medications for the hyperlipidemia, and then depending on how bad the swelling is, you can treat it. Next, we're going to talk about immune complex nephrotic syndrome. We'll focus on one of these, membranous nephropathy, although there are other immune complex diseases very similar to this. However, they create a nephritic syndrome, which is not this video. So when it comes to immune complex nephrotic syndrome, one of the most common reasons for nephrotic syndrome is membranous nephropathy. Remember, membranous nephropathy is 30% cause of nephrotic syndrome. This is the most common cause in Caucasian adults. It's due to an immune complex deposition. So what do we mean by that? Here is the basement membrane, and these little things here, the pizza pies, are immune complexes. So what they'll do is it'll be created for some reason in the body, and then it may deposit in this case, subepithelial. So the epithelial cells, remember, are the podocytes. So this is kind of depositing right under the podocytes. And when that happens, the glomerulus reacts by building some basement membrane around these immune complexes. Because of that, you develop a very thick membrane that shows up on immunofluorescence. Here's the immunofluorescence. Because it's lighting up like this, you know that it is an immune complex disease. If it did not light up, it would not be an immune complex disease. On H&E, you also have a thick basement membrane. Here's H&E, and you can see these little circles. They're pretty thick. That pink portion is pretty thick, way thicker than normal. Also on electron microscopy, what you'll see is kind of this spike and dome appearance. So the basement membrane reacts by trying to build its way around these immune deposits, and that's why some people call it spike and dome appearance. So on electron microscopy are the spikes, and the other parts are the dome, and that's just basement membrane building its way around the immune complexes. It can be diagnosed by biopsy, but there are FDA-approved serologic testing for antibodies that can be used as well. Typically, treatment is conservative therapy with kidney protection, cholesterol medications, and treating the swelling. You may use steroids, but you might have a poor response. In general, a third of patients will have spontaneous remission. A third of them will have continued proteinuria, but good kidney function. And a third of them will progress to end-stage renal disease within 10 years. So a little bit better prognosis than FSGS, but still those aren't really good numbers. The swelling in this case can typically get slowly progressive and 25% of the time people are actually prone to thrombotic events. Another cause of nephrotic syndrome is diabetes. Diabetes is also the leading cause of CKD and end-stage kidney disease. The idea is that a lot of glucose will cause glycosylation of the basement membrane, so it'll deposit on the basement membrane or react with the basement membrane. Because of that, it will cause scarring and therefore it will have a high backup pressure in the glomerulus. So if you have scarring of the basement membrane, it's not as easy for things to go through and so there's a backup of pressure. As a consequence of a higher pressure, they might be more protein that leaks through the system. Again, ACEs or ARBs are good because what you're going to do is you're going to dilate the exiting blood vessel and as a result, decrease the pressure on the glomerulus. You should start slow with an ACE and an ARB and titrate to the maximally tolerated dose in diabetics. Eventually, if it continues to have this scarring or sclerosis, you might get something called kimmelstein wilson nodules. And here is an example. So in the mesangium, you'll have these nodules here, these large nodules that are characteristic of diabetic nephropathy. That's why in diabetics, we always check their protein. We check a yearly microalbumin. Nowadays, there's also new therapies with SGLTs and GLPs, which may also decrease kidney disease progression. When it comes to diagnosing nephrotic syndrome, you'll start with a positive dipstick. You'll probably get some protein on the dipstick. You want to confirm that with an early morning urine sample to confirm the elevated protein levels. 
what you can do is order a urine protein creatinine ratio and if that's above 3.5 then that's consistent with nephrotic syndrome you also need to have low protein or low albumin typically below 2.5 to 3. the total cholesterol is often elevated and people may have swelling so if you have these things very likely you're dealing with nephrotic syndrome you want to look for common causes in this situation look for hematuria because just because you have protein doesn't mean it's nephrotic syndrome if you have blood also then it could be nephritic syndrome you want to look at a renal function panel check electrolytes and aki sometimes which is an acute kidney injury may be associated check a liver panel hepatitis remember there's secondary causes of nephrotic syndrome Think about glucose testing, diabetes, autoimmune condition testing, complement values. Sometimes you can do a renal biopsy. It'll be considered if it will help with your management or there's you're treating the patient and they're not getting better. You can also think about using imaging to see the other parts of the body and how they're reacting to nephrotic syndrome. So if you have low albumin state or low protein state, then you're going to have swelling possibly in other parts of the body, such as the lungs, the heart, the abdomen. And, and so you can consider chest x-rays, echoes, abdominal ultrasound, etc. A little bit more detail on general guidelines of management. For proteinuria, we typically use ARBs or ACEs. Sometimes people may be immunosuppressed, and because of that reason, you can use steroids, biologics, other kinds of those medications. Because of the swelling, sometimes you can use Lasix or Bumex, very commonly used. Here are some details on how you can dose them. You can actually go very high on these doses if it's needed. For an increased risk of infection due to a loss of certain types of proteins. There's no clear guidelines on giving medications prophylactically. Same thing with cholesterol. There's no guidelines on managing elevated cholesterol with no other reasons to give cholesterol medication. In terms of venous thrombosis risk, you can take a look at how severe the albumin levels are and make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis, but there is no guidelines.